Hi there, I'm playing with Chunk again and this time I have five iPads. Oh no, six. This one just doesn't have a box. I got the, those iPads from a colleague at work. He stored them for a couple of years in his closet and uh, yeah, they were used by uh, field technicians a couple of years ago. Uh, then, well, it's all iPad ones, as you can see here, except that one is an iPad 2. And uh, yeah, they are pretty outdated, outdated today because the maximum iOS version you can put on is 5.1. Any newer version doesn't work, you cannot update it anymore. So that means you are stuck with an old browser, you are stuck with, well, the apps that are installed, because in the Apple Store you don't get any newer apps that still work with iOS 5. Maybe there are a couple, I don't know, I, I tried once to find uh, some, but uh, yeah, it's a bit difficult. The other problem is because these iPads have been stored for a very long time, they completely drained their battery and two of them are not working anymore. And I think that's a pretty interesting problem that I was able to uh, to solve and uh, I want to show you what I did. The first thing I did was to plug in the charger to see if I could charge it up and some of them started both show the Apple logo, but that one goes off, comes again, goes off, comes again, while this one starts normally. So I suspected, of course, that has to do with, uh, with the battery, because that one had still had some percent of battery charge. At the moment it is 68. I charged it up a little bit more. And this one seems to be completely depleted in the from the battery charge. So it turns on, it turns off, it turns on. So I thought, well, let it run for an hour. Okay, no difference. Five hours, no difference. 24 hours, still turning on and off. Then I googled this problem and I found that many iOS devices, Apple devices, have that problem. Even iPhones and iPads, everything. The problem is, so what I uh, see here, it wants to boot. It needs some power. The power supply can deliver... Let me see how much. I think one point something amps. 2.1 amp. Okay. 2.1. So that should be enough for this device to work. That's more than... 10 watts at 5 volt, but it seems it, it's not enough. So I hooked in my USB tester here and I saw that it is actually drawing between half an amp and one amp only. It could, of course, draw two amps, but it doesn't. Someone decided that's probably a bad idea. 
I don't know. So let's turn that off again. We don't want to deplete that battery too. And um, yeah, so my first idea was I could use a stronger power supply, one with more amps. The next problem is you cannot just connect any power su supply here. For example, if I take this power supply that has 5 volt on the power pins and nothing happens. It doesn't even turn on. The problem is Apple, like many other uh, manufacturer, decided to communicate from the device with the power supply somehow to find out what kind of power supply is installed, is it compatible, whatever. So there are different power supply versions. So standard USB is 500 milliamps. Um, then up to one amp. I don't think I don't know if this is already USB 2 that is rated for one amp. Uh, and then they had all kind of charger up to two and a half amp. And well, and I'm, I'm not speaking about USB-C, which is modern right now that goes up to many, many apps. I'm talking about this USB one or two devices. Okay, but anyway, they could have decided to let an unknown power supply charge this up with one uh, with a half an amp, 500 milliamps. But they decided not to charge at all if the power supply is not an Apple branded one or any one that is compatible. Then I found an interesting schematic or a table in the internet. And the table simply said they are using the data plus and data minus lines, which are not used when in the power supply when you're just charging the device. So that's the data plus and minus lines of the USB. They are using these two lines to determine which power supply is attached. So, if these two lines have 2 volts, then it is defined that you have no uh, 0 0.5 amps. That's what the power supply delivers. If D plus is 2 volts, and D minus is 2.7 volts, that means that it is a power supply that can supply 1 amp. If D plus is 2.7 volt and D minus is 2 volt, so we have a 2.1 power amp power supply. Sorry, remember that. That's also a 2.1 amp power supply, the original one. Then we could also have 2.7 volts here and 2.7 volts here. And that means it's a 2.4 amp power supply. Well, with this in mind, I made this thing here. has a USB connector, a USB receptacle, and two potentiometers. Because the original schematic that came from the net 
was about this uh, voltage divider here goes to D plus another voltage divider from USB plus 5 and ground goes to D minus and then you have different values for the resistors to make these voltages so I thought why bothering with resistors that probably are wrong and maybe my device draws more current on this uh, data lines or maybe not I take some potentiometers and I have one for data plus and one for data minus which is the green and the white wire here and uh, well the circuit is pretty simple we have plus 5 volt here we have that potentiometer we have ground here and that goes to the data line and the second potentiometer of course to the other data line plus and minus then I added some uh, some test points here to measure the voltage and I started to adjust and guess what happened the 2.1 amp setting works so let me show you that you don't have to believe it I will prove it Ta-da! It turns on. But, of course, so let's put that USB tester in between. We see we have 5.1 volts. We have half an amp. And when it turns off, it draws no power, comes again, half an amp. So that's 2.2 watts and that's not enough to start that darn thing. By the way, this USB tester here is pretty handy and it has a, a remarkable feature. It has an USB plug that goes in either way. So you can plug it in like that or you can plug it in like that and it still works because they put the contact strip here in the center so the USB connector can go on either side. They have contacts on each side yeah, that's pretty clever. USB should have been designed like this from the beginning. And we wouldn't have all these funny problems with... Is it going that way or that way? Okay, anyway. It doesn't help. It also doesn't help if you take a a stronger power supply with more amps. I think this one has about 5 amps on all the connectors here. Yeah, so what helps? Charging doesn't work. More amps can't be put into this iPad because it only takes half an amp. It could take more but they decided it has to start up with half an amp and then when it started then it takes the full power and charges the battery but when the battery is empty well it's like a car with an empty battery you have to jump start it and so the basic idea is pretty simple if we can charge it through the connector 
we have to charge the battery directly. There is a battery inside. This battery has contacts. We can hook up the lab power supply to the contacts and charge the battery. Then we put everything together and we can do a normal charge here, but we have to jump start it. So this is an iPad 1. And uh, a good thing is it has no glue around here, so you don't have to heat it up or do anything to make any glue soft here. But they have another, uh, well, pretty unusual design here. Uh, let me explain that shortly. So I'm talking about the, the long sides here and here. And on one side, that's the unibody case that looks like this. Uh, maybe you can't see it unless it's so far away. So the display is here. That's the case here, goes up to the other side. Display. Okay. On one side there are holes here and the plastic has notches that goes into these holes like so. That's the black plastic rim you see here inside the aluminium part. Like that. Okay. On the other side they also have some holes here but they made some, uh, some metal springs that are attached here with a screw on the display part with the display frame. And that springy thing goes in here. So when you assemble that, you just hook it in on this side and then you push it down here and it snaps in and it stays. Wonderful. The problem is, if you try to open that on this side, you break all these metal uh, clamps here. So we have to f open that side first. Then we can lift the display up like so. And hopefully we can keep most of these springy retainers here. Okay, that's the theory. In reality, on the side with the uh, volume button and the silencer switch here, that's the side where these plastic tabs are and that's the side where these metal springy things are. And the metal springy things are also here and here. So it's completely impossible to remove that panel without breaking any of these metal springs. But if I only can save those on this side we can clip it in and these ones are not so important. Okay, let's try that. And well, I have to say that uh, I know that because first I saw a video on YouTube about the iPad 1 and I already opened one and tried this jump start method here. And yes, it worked. So let's see if it works too on this iPad here. So I'm trying to get in near between the aluminium and the um, plastic. Uh, don't go too close to the switches because you could damage the switch 
mechanic and you need a very stable spatula like this one because uh, a flimsy and thin one like this one it's too weak you need to force it, it out it sounds nasty it sounds like breaking something but there is no other way to get in and there is always the danger of breaking the glass if you are not careful enough I have already destroyed another iPad well it had another problem so I gave it the rest yeah it's pretty easy with this tool here it's very stable massive uh, steel yeah and here you can see the first of this spring metal things here probably if you can see that and it's already yeah it's already broken so they bend back and if you bend it to the original position they break off super hard metal hardened steel or something like that but pretty dumb in this uh, configuration so I have to put something in between here I hate these corners, they are difficult. Okay, now it works. I wonder why it is allowed to produce something that is almost unrepairable. And I mean, it's not only the iPad 1, it's all these mobile devices, phones, and not only Apple. There are some better models and there are some worse models. I mean for the newest iPhone 11, they developed a laser machine to remove the back glass because otherwise you couldn't do that and now I broke this plastic here okay that's not meant to okay now it jumps out okay next thing you have to be careful is the all the cables here so i already unplugged the no it's not unplugged yet there is the wi-fi cable that goes now it's unplugged that's the shortest one then we have here another black cable that is glued with some sticky tape and yep 
then we have this cable here that comes from the front no not camera this one has no camera not on the front and not on the back so that cable goes out like so okay and we're in and that's the last big cable here that's for the display i guess where all the pixels go through from the cpu to the display okay now we can take a view on this wand that's the metal taps here i hope you can see that and you see they are formed like a hook and if you push this display into the case they bend a little bit in and they snap into the groove here but if you try to remove them uh, that happens this one is broken off this one is broken this yes this one this one and another one no no there is no there is none on this side okay let's see where are there are all the broken tabs some pieces of plastic some rubber feet from inside okay so that's all the stuff that breaks off yeah there is another one i want to have them all outside the case i don't want to them to short something so what's next we see here the pcb everything is shielded all the cpu memory stuff here here is where the uh, antenna was plugged in one of the antennas there is another wire going here probably that's the uh, LTE mobile communication stuff here and the other antenna is just Wi-Fi then there is something with Bluetooth what's that here oh that's the power button has a wire here then we have these buttons has other wires they go here here uh, there is a connector so I think the iPad models without the uh, mobile communication um, option they simply don't have this board or maybe another board and here is sim card slot accessible from the outside that goes via a cable yes yeah, somewhere what but what is interesting me is the batteries so we have two batteries and as i found out they are connected in parallel so we only have to remove the insulator only from one battery because the other is connected in parallel so we if we charge that one we also charge that one they are not in series we don't need a balancer or anything like that and the question is where are they connected so the answer is they are connected here underneath that strip that goes to the io port the uh, power charger connector universal port here but we don't have to remove that that doesn't help anyway because we need the contacts directly at the battery that's the easiest way to get and we can see there is a hollow space here underneath that tape here or underneath that foil and if we cut that where is it
Okay, I have to find the spot. Okay, here is it. You have to be careful because the battery contacts are directly under that. And if you short them, well, these batteries are empty anyway, but if you do that with an iPad that probably has some juice in the batteries. Okay, there's some... Yeah, that's one of the battery contacts here. So I cut that off. What's that? The other iPad didn't have this kind of tape. Okay, let's get rid of that. Sticks on my fingers. I don't like that. Uh, there is also a danger if you cut the battery itself. So there is a closer look. You can see there is one contact that goes to a little PCB here. And that's the other one here. So, just in case we don't know where plus and minus are, we can of course measure that here and here. And we measure a voltage of 0.74 volts. Yes, that's not a good value for a lithium-ion battery. It should have at least 3 volts or something, even when it's empty. But we can see clearly plus is here, minus is here. Let's convert the Rigol bench power supply into a lithium-ion charger. So I go to channel 1, which has the probes already attached. Uh, 4.2 volts, that's the maximum voltage for most of these lithium batteries. Then I give it 1 amp. And, well, that's it. Let's connect it. With the maximum voltage of 4.2 volts, we cannot overcharge the battery here. And uh, when it reaches 4.2 volts, the current starts to drop. And when it drops below, let's say, 50 milliamps or 100 milliamps, we can say this battery is full, but we don't have to charge that much because, well, it, it's enough if we charge it up to 10% or something, just enough to get this iPad booting and then we can charge it in the normal way. So let's hook that up. And you see voltage is rapidly raising. It's already 2.6 volt. Uh, current is 0 0.999 amp, so one amp. And 2.9 volt. So now uh, at the beginning the voltage raises pretty fast because this battery is way below its uh, normal voltage and now we reach 3 volt and you already see the voltage raise is slower 3.1 so it takes more time uh, for the voltage to raise and I think when we reach I don't know 4 volts or something like that I will stop and then assemble the iPad again and see if it takes charge from the original charger 
maybe that's the right time for a short warning. Never charge lithium batteries like this unattended. So especially when they are deeply discharged like this one, there is a certain danger that something happens and if that happens, well, it's better you are close here to the device you're working with than anywhere else, maybe not at home, that's the worst you could do. You have to check them from time to time if they get hot, probably, warm, hot. Normally they stay at room temperature, especially when they are charged with only one amp. Uh, I just see I'm charging, I'm not charging at all. Why that? Maybe one of my, ah, now it's charging again. That's the other reason why you should be around. Sometimes things just fall off or don't make contact in the way they should. You can also see here we are out of the dead zone of this battery. We are now in a region where it really takes charge, so the voltage raises very slowly in comparison to what was before. We jumped from 1 volt to 2 volt to 3 volt and now we are getting millivolts per second. But that's okay. I mean, it's a large battery. It takes some time to charge. Alright, it's now about one hour later. I started at 7 p.m. You probably heard the clock bell. And we have now 4 volts. Okay. Uh, I crank the uh, the current a little bit up to one and a half amp. Uh, that means after one hour we should have one and a half watt hours, uh, amp hours in our battery. Uh, total capacity is about 6.5 or 6.6 .6 amp hours. We can see that here. They have labeled that pretty nicely. It's on the top, uh, upside down. I know 3.75 volts, 24.8 watt hours, and amp hours is of course watt hours divided by the volts, and that's about 6.6. .6. Okay, so. Let's turn that off. So, what I need is a little bit of black tape. To close that hole again. Okay, as good as new. One of the trickiest parts is to get all these connectors back to where they belong. Okay, I think I start with the big one, that's the most complicated to get in. So there is a white line here. You can see that there's a, a dotted white line and that indicates how far this connector goes into this socket here. It's just pushed in, there is no mechanical contraption. And when the white line meets this uh, connector edge, it is in the right position. Oh, 
Okay, then let's see if we can connect that one here. Sometimes it works better when you use your fingers because then you feel when yes that's it okay then the next one would be this one don't know what exactly that connector is oh, i think you can hardly see it because i can hardly see it this has this movable tab here that goes around the connector so when the connector is seated properly into the uh, socket there you can flip that over and it uh, holds it in place and if it doesn't work then you probably haven't plugged in correctly I wonder how they do that in the factory when they have to assemble thousands of these things per day. Now there is the moment of truth. We plug that in and hopefully we get some, yeah, we get something. We get an empty battery symbol and we get the apple logo and i hope this time it stays on seems so much longer than for the first time yeah no sim card yes i removed the sim card and it said 24 24 percent oops where is it here is it and it's charging okay 24 percent i said it is a six amp hour battery i charged it with about one and a half amp hours that's a quarter 25 percent yeah we have a display of 24 so that's pretty precise i'm surprised okay so the last action would be to close the entire housing here and let's see okay that i will Turn it off. And now it starts again because I did something on the power plug. Well, anyway, it should. Oh. Ah. That's how it looks inside. It has a, a internal illumination like a, a fridge. Only in this case it illuminates also when it is closed. Okay, so I hope I'm doing nothing bad here. We have the plastic taps on this side where the switch here is. Then we lie, lay that in and here you can see now this metal hooks and they simply snap in so that's the easy part that's how they do it in the factory then they remove all the fingerprints yeah so we lost the metal hooks here on the narrow side and here well on this side i think we didn't have any oops that was not in place correctly well as i said i chipped some 
plastic here, there is a crack here, so that was my fault. I shouldn't have levered against this plastic here, but that's not a problem. It's only cosmetic and if I really want, I could replace that, but that makes not much sense. Now, next question is, what can we do with an iPad 1? That even has iOS 4.2. Is that right? Is that the iOS version? Yes, I think so. We could update this to 5.1 if that is still available. Yeah, we could. But what we definitely, uh, definitely can is we can use it as an iPod. Is there still any music on it? Mm, no. These guys didn't use that for music. They used it for work. Um, but it's a pretty well or pretty good uh, audio player, music player. It has Bluetooth. You can connect Bluetooth speakers to that and you have your own standalone music system with a nice big display. You can also connect headphones. Um, the mobile uh, communication option here is no longer useful because, for example, in Switzerland they shut down the 2G networks and I think also the 3G networks by the end of this year. So this will not work anymore with the with the SIM card in, in the mobile network. It will use of, uh, work, of course, with a VLAN. We have a wireless LAN here, that's not a problem. Web browser is, of course, extremely old and uh, there are many web pages that are not displayed uh, properly. Sometimes you get the pictures, sometimes you get the text, but all the new uh, HTTP version, I don't know where we are, does not work. But uh, a lot of things still work. You won't get any uh, new apps because in the App Store every app needs at least, I don't know, iOS 9, 10, 11. Certainly there, there is nothing for iOS 5 or even 4. Uh, I have looked up and I found nothing. Maybe there is somewhere something, but mm, it's a bit difficult. But I have now five iPad 1s and one iPad 2 and maybe you guys have a good idea what to do with them. Tell me that in the comments. Okay, so thanks for watching.